go Chick-fil-A. This uh, installment of Koi Beginner is going to contain um, information about how to treat uh, fish diseases. And I'm going to try to orient you to uh, one way of looking at uh, fish diseases. I want you to look at all fish diseases exactly the same way. And you might go, why do we have to look at fish diseases all the same way? I mean, if I see a sore on the side of my fish, then I would treat a sore, right? Or if I saw, um, you know, a slimy fish or whatever, then obviously we know that's trichodina, so we would want to treat your slimy fish with an anti-parasite remedy, and the answer is no. Um, when you see a sore on a fish, that's usually a bacterial sore or an ulcer, and uh, when you see that, uh, it usually means that something's been going on with the fish, something to stress it out to where it would be vulnerable to a bacterial infection. I always say bacteria do not cause bacterial infections. Uh, environmental issues and handling and that sort of thing usually are what cause bacteria, uh, bacterial infections. And of course those would manifest as sores or dropsy or gill rot or fin rot or whatever. And we'll talk about bacterial infections someday soon. But let's talk about uh, fish disease outbreaks. When you see a fish disease outbreaks, they're all handled exactly the same way, and this is so you don't miss anything. You make no assumptions about what's going on with the fish when they're sick, and it's real easy. First thing you do when you see a fish disease outbreak is look at the crowding situation in the pond. If the pond's crowded, this could be a good cause of illness. What you want to have is one inch of fish per 10 gallons of water in your pond. So if your fish, your pond is 300 gallons, let's say, 300 gallons, you should have 30 inches of fish tops. And if you have a lot more than 30 inches of fish, then maybe that's a contributor to the disease problem. Second, if the fish aren't crowded, then what you want to do is uh, test your nitrogen cycle. I know that sounds all complicated and everything, but you, what you buy is like an Aquarium Pharmaceuticals master test kit. They're like, I don't know, 25 bucks. And the first test would be ammonia. Second test would be nitrite. Third test would be nitrate. And the fourth test would be pH. And um, there's a download at koivet.com that will tell you what all the normals for that are supposed to be uh, and what you do if the uh, numbers were deranged. But 70% of the time, you're going to find the problem with your fish in water quality testing, believe it or not. And uh, it's interesting because, like, if you have a fish with a bacterial sore on it, like one or two fish with bacterial sores, sometimes you just fix the water quality and the bacterial sores go away on their own. This is particularly true if the bacterial sore is on a fish that's eating and schooling. If a fish is eating and schooling, you probably don't need to mess with it. If your water quality is absolutely perfect, then the next thing to consider would be parasites. Don't skip the water quality step to go right to the parasite thing. Then what you would do is you would try to find out if there's a koi club in your area or find somebody who knows how to use a microscope, maybe even a biology teacher or student at the local college or high school. Um, find out if there's anyone in your area who knows how to use a microscope to diagnose parasites. That way you're not guessing. Um, if you can find somebody to do a biopsy on the surface of the fish and on the gills, and that's all described over at koivet.com, and there's downloads in the download section at drjohnson.com or drjohnson.com downloads that actually show wet lab techniques there's a giant video on there as well um, but anyway the next so the next step after water quality is biopsy and if you said I don't want a biopsy okay then basically you're going to end up just guest treating for parasites that can be a mistake but salt is great for that and there's an article on salt over koivet.com so to review it would basically be water quality testing nitrogen and pH, then you would go on to a diagnosis of parasites if you need to, uh, and, and then if you had to guess treatment. If your water quality is perfect and there are no parasites in there, then it has to be environmental or maybe even viral. And when you get into those types of cases, then you probably need to call Koi Lab, K-O-I-L-A-B dot com. There's a phone number on there. You call and find out what kind of samples you should send down. But then, because if you don't find it in water quality, which is 70% of the time, and in parasites, which is the other 20% of the time, then you're looking at 10% odds that it is a virus or a bacteria. Uh, double check the entire environment to make sure the water, water looks good. There's plenty of aeration. Um, the, fish are happy and not crowded and that sort of thing. Find out in the history whether or not a person got fish without quarantine. 
and uh, if you get into a dire situation, then you might end up having to get with uh, Coil Lab and have samples done for KHV and or um, bacterial infection. So, uh, and, and then you might say, well, so well, I understand that I want to do it always the same way as far as disease cases and that sort of thing, but see, sometimes there's a legal outcome for different disease problems. Like you might want to say some point, you might want to say, he sold me fish that were sick, or I bought fish from that person and they, and, and they all died and I want my money back or whatever. If you didn't diagnose everything, if you don't go through it in a systematic fashion, what will happen in court is the um, defense the uh, defense is going to get up and they're going to say, did you check the pH on those dead fish? And if you have to say, no, I didn't, I uh, assumed it was KHV, uh, I didn't check the pH, then the case gets thrown out because the defense expert witness will say, Your Honor, um, the person bypassed an important test and we, you can't prove that it was coy herpes virus that killed the fish when in, uh, there's a very real possibility that the pH crash did. So you have to cover all your bases. So if you're a pro doing this, you want to make sure you run it in a systematic fashion, uh, going through nitrogen cycle, pH, and then diagnostics of parasites, bacteria, and viruses in that order. Um, or if you're a hobbyist, you would want to do it in that order too, just so you didn't miss anything. You covered all your bases, made no assumptions, and you played the statistics that 70% of the problems are going to be water quality, 20% parasites, and 10% bacterial and viral. So that's what I wanted to cover today. All fish disease cases are handled exactly the same way, basically. And then uh, with that in mind, what we can do is we can talk about testing water and what you're looking for. And then after, and I'll just talk you through uh, individually, like ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and what their significance are. And then I'll do a series of videos on the parasites and their basic overview of the parasites and how they're treated. Um, the fish medicine is really pretty easy, actually. Um, there's a few cases, usually two to five percent of cases, that are real head scratchers. And the rest of them are just garden variety water quality problems, seriously. And um, if you want to know what makes fish sick, it's probably the water. Parasites are there all the time but they only get the other, uh, upper hand when water quality is uh, not so good. To uh, end the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a screen place folder and run an extra minute because when you upload videos to YouTube, they cut off the last minute. So I'm going to give you a minute uh, of just a, uh, a screen that has some links on it. Real um, high tech for sure. Um, it just kind of tells you where you might get more information and that sort of thing, but also uh, holds space for... Um, for uh, about a minute or so, so I can add that time to have it truncated. Most people never even see the screen because um, it truncates well before that. So I usually give an elongated uh, exit. Go Chick-fil-A. I'm having Chick-fil-A uh, uh, caffeine-free Diet Coke for uh, with my Cliff Bar for lunch. It's pretty good. Then I'm going to take a nap because I'm lazy, sleepy guy. I'm going to kill the sound now and I'm going to give it another minute and uh, sure appreciate you visiting. Thanks. Keep an eye on KoiBeginner.com for more videos.